Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there at HRT in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And... Because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Age of Radio. Brendan and I have a special guest here who'd like to say something. If it's a goddamn train, Jason, I swear to God. Thomas did want to speak about this episode. I don't know why. Okay. Because Neil Oliver's not a train? Can trains, when trains see people, do they just think they're like different versions of trains? Kind of like when like a cat sees a human, they just think it's a big cat. That's uh, that's my working theory. Okay. Um, but uh, no, I'd like to bring in our special guest today, and he needs no introduction. So uh, come on in. Yes, hello. It's been a while. Oh, or as I might say, a long time. Alec, you're not doing the voice. I am, of course, doing the voice. I just was not quite as nasally there. You see, oh, there we go, yes. No, I, I had a bit of a frog in my throat, and when I have a frog in my throat, it makes me sound normal. Now, I've, I've asked to speak here today uh, on the subject of last week's movie, All of Twist. You, uh, of course, noted my fantastic and award-winning performance as Fagan, the uh, uh, ne'er-do-well that led Oliver to his uh, ultimate doom. Well, I think Jason was the only one to point out how problematic it, in fact, was. Uh, yeah, he, I, I seem to remember you being very supportive of the character. And he was harking on it very hard, saying, I think Alligator should be ashamed of himself. I think we were most of the things Jason said. Well, I, I have to say... Um, Yes, J- uh, this this Jason you speak of. Yes, he seems like a very sharp young lad. Um, because yes, it wasn't right. It wasn't correct. I I was, uh, as I say, I, I understand that I was completely and, and totally wonderful in the role and, and perfect for it. Uh, because of course I have the talent, you see, to play those sorts of roles. But I I I, I don't feel comfortable anymore. It's been. Oh, how long is it? A long time. A long time, I'd say. Uh, 70 plus years. And I, I mean, I've been dead for 20. And this is the first time I've actually thought, sat down and thought, hmm, perhaps that wasn't correct. So uh, I, I just want to say if anyone, uh, Jew or otherwise, were, was offended by my performance, I, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, sorry. It just wasn't appropriate and, and isn't now. Uh, so, uh, what I propose is that uh, uh, I will be reprising the role in a Republican Heaven produced version of it that you will get to see when you are dead. Oh. And for your sake, Brendan, I hope it is very, very soon. Um, oh, okay. I shall see you, not for a long time, uh, but quite soon. Uh, Engage jetpack. Wow, he must have, like, not paid the full premium because he has to have one of those... He has to actually say engage jetpack. Most people just get their jetpack and take off. 
Well, most of them like the Sage Ed pack, but uh, uh, yeah, no, he's got the voice controls because he's very old and his hands are very gnarly. You'd think in heaven they would restore you to your most youthful form, but they don't. No, in fact, they, it looks like they keep aging you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that seems mean. That does seem mean. What What is Oliver Reed looking like these days? Ooh, ooh, no. A well, shell well you know what? If, if anything, he's well-preserved. A, a shell of his former self, quite literally, because he looks like a turtle shell. Can you imagine the shit that Oliver Reed must be causing in heaven? If he's there. <laughs> I mean, he shouldn't be by rights. But you know what? He had a way of talking his way into things. He was very charismatic. Jason, this is a podcast. This is a podcast. And it's called For Screen and Country. And I already said your name was Jason. But my name is Brendan. It still is. And uh, the, on this podcast, what do we do, Jason? What the heck do we do? We work our way. We are working our way. We have been working our way through the top 100 films as ordained by the British Film Institute in the year of our Lord, 1999. Amen. Preach it, brother. And we're doing it every week, one movie at a time. And this week is no exception. Say it ain't so. My so, yeah, this week is no exception. You're you're correct. Uh, we're going to talk about another movie on this list, on this BFI Top 100. But before we do that, Jason, we should read some comments regarding the last movie we talked about. And that was, of course, David Lean's Oliver Twist. Please, sir, I have some more comments. Here's a story of a lovely lady huh. who was bra- Wait, I'm doing the real thing. <laughs> you're just singing. You're just singing the Brady Bunch theme song. I, I'm. I, I'm not taking any <laughs> artistic uh, liberties with it. What is it parody? Because you're singing it in your own dumb voice. All of them had hair of gold, like their mother. The, the youngest, youngest one, one uncurled. uncurled. How dare you? Well, I just was trying to parody Do it. Do not disgrace that song. <laughs> Jason, we have to read some comments. Why do you always sound so put out? <laughs> These are the people expressing their opinions, and you just are like, bah, comments. That's actually what the segment is called. Bah, comments. Do you even read the show notes? Bah, comments. All right, let's get to it, Jason. Blah, 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 comments. Uh, Mr. Day Lewis, can you come in here? <laughs> yes. What uh, What can I can do? Can you man? get straighten him out? Look, Jason. If I may call you that, you're going to have to shape up, or you're going to have to ship out. And you know very well that I will be able to take over your life, and you won't even understand how quickly that will happen. I mean, I I do understand how quickly it will happen because you've already done it. So uh, I I will shape up. Thank you very much. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. Whoosh. And shave your legs. That's they, for you, Jason. Were, oh, for I, me. It, it sounded like I was screaming at him, but it actually meant it for you. No, oh, I like my legs. I thought you were leaving. I thought he took your place. I'm so confused. Okay, comments. <laughs> About Oliver Twist. Yeah. Our first comment comes from the one who keeps this podcast afloat, literally telling me today that uh, an episode posted was actually an old episode yeah. under a new episode title, as well as a few other people. But Sharon was the first one to message me. So Sharon Horwat. She s- keeps the lights on for screen and country. Like almost literally. Yeah. <laughs> Sharon Horwat says, I like David Lean's film. Okay. But this is not his best work. That portrayal of Fagin dot, dot, dot. Woof. Uh, for me, the best version of Oliver twist is Oliver and company. No, I'm not kidding. Why should I worry? Is a straight up bop. I don't remember any of the songs from Oliver and Company, but I do remember liking it. I have not seen Oliver and Company since 1988. Well, there you go. That's all I have to say about that. And that's all I have to say about that. But our next comment is from another serial commenter, our friend Andrew Littlefield, who Make writes, your joke. Nope. No more. <laughs> and uh, Andrew writes, dear fellas, he doesn't write that. I'm putting that in. I'm editorializing. What he actually said was, the musical Oliver won Best Picture, and while I don't think it deserved it, it beat 2001 for crying out loud... I think it's the best version of the story. I haven't seen the Polanski version for, you know, reasons. Why? What happened? Uh, well, you know, (laughs) I think he might have seen the Ninth Gate and had the same reaction I did. (laughs) I get that, though. Um, There's some people I'm just like, I don't need to see them anymore. I'm always willing to give somebody a chance, and uh, I, I would watch that just out of pure morbid curiosity. Jason, um, of course, the um, uh, in his private life, a staunch, a staunch Woody Allen defender. Oh, uh, well, hey. I mean, uh, I believe his Facebook page, you can join it today. It's called uh, Cancel Soon Ye. I think you may have misunderstood when that time I said that I really liked Getting Even. I think Getting Even is one of the funniest things ever written, but uh, that's as far as I'll go. Um, get You really liked Getting Even, dot, 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 free Woody, I believe what you said mm, i'm dispute you on that but uh moving on kyle keppen 
says, hold on to your Dutch angles and check out Carol. By the way, I first I thought it said Dutch angels. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about, Whoa. Kyle Kepin? Um, hold on to your Dutch angles and check out Carol Reed's Oliver. I mean, it's the only version I've seen, but it's got some absolute bangers and is solidly entertaining. Also, Annie is a pretty solid version of Oliver Twist. Little Orphan Annie? Yeah. I mean, it's basically Oliver Twist. Does she end up in a gang of pickpockets? Yes. Hmm. Don't 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 Google it. Uh, well, it, it isn't any more like if we saw like the end of Oliver Twist was most of the movie. Like if he went to live with the rich people and then lived his life. Like I, th- if, I think I think he just means it's kind of a spin off of it a little bit. I mean, I, I, if you want to challenge Kyle? That's up to you. I mean, if you look, think I'm, Kyle is somehow less than human, no, I mean that's not. certainly your prerogative. No, I, and and I'm not going to stop you from making that valid point, Brendan. Invalid point, I Brendan. should say. Kyle is a great person, and Brendan? I'm just not, I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not going to have you slander <laughs> Kyle on the podcast anymore this is the last time i let you do it on or off air mister and in fact uh our lawyers are gonna be talking with you later i am gonna the search for the new co-host begins now send in your send in your your ballots to for screen and country at gmail.com jason you were saying kyle i i apologize if i caused any offense oh okay that's good that's better all right yeah we're good now let's move on sure our next comment brendan michael boyce good Solid name, Michael Boyce, says, Yes, it's the definitive version. It takes an episodic and honestly convoluted plot and makes it work as a film narrative. All other versions owe something to Lean's film, and it's not even Lean's best work. Well, I certainly agree with that. It's not Lean's best work, no. Um, But damn good film. Yeah. I I, I really like this comment. Uh, Just a quick one here from Charlie Harris. Too anti-Semitic for this Jew. That seems like a reasonable uh, perspective. I think I think that POV, <laughs> yep, totally. Yeah. Uh, yep. But uh, then we move on to JF. Jay says, for me, David Lean is such an epic filmmaker, and this is one of his weak links. Oliver is the definitive version for me. His version of Great Expectations, on the other hand, is wonderful. I, ju- I just wanted to mention, there's like three comments where people said Oliver is the best mm. one. Yeah, I know. That, uh, and that's one we've been like, Kind of dreading a little Cautious. bit. Cautious. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. So hopefully hopefully we'll be blown away as much as we were by David Lean's version. Maybe it's a banger. We'll, we'll see. Uh, if, if the music's good, that's what matters, right? Um, Michael M.G., I'm assuming that stands for musical guest. Um, <laughs> or is it, is it Mick G.? Oh, shit. Do you think it's Mick G.? <laughs> I think it's Mick G. All right. Um, uh, Charlie's Angels Full Throttle director Mick G. says... I love the the Polanski version, saw it twice in the theaters, though it's been too long since I saw it, or the lean version to really compare. And I, though Oliver is treacly, as someone who enjoys musicals, I will say that it has a fantastic score, just deserves a better movie. I'm excited to watch Oliver. Twice in the theater he saw it. He saw a Roman Polanski movie twice yeah. in a theater. The Oliver Twist one, yeah. Wow. I'm impressed. I mean, you had to have gone in within like two weeks then, because I don't think his movies are in theaters for very long. Yeah. The Ninth Gate, I saw it in the theater, just the once. <laughs> Do you think every movie he made is the same quality yes. as The Ninth Gate? Yes, because Rosemary's 100%. Baby doesn't exist, right? I feel like I must have seen some of his other movies. Name them. Rosemary's Baby. Okay, we got that one. <laughs> um, ninth Gate. I can't think of any other. Oliver Twist. The Ghost Rider. It was a movie that came out like ten years ago. The Ghost Rider. Yep, starring uh, Ewan McGregor. Was it was it based on the PBS Kids show? No, I don't believe so, but okay. I'll have to double check that. Right. Hmm. <laughs> Jason, that those are the com- those are the comments we have. I would like you to tell us right now. Sure. Um, this is your your new role on the show job. as of late. Um, I would like to know because we're going to compare this movie. This movie was number forty six on the BFI Top One Hundred, and we are going to compare it to the movie on the American Film Institute Top One Hundred list that is number forty six. That's the two thousand and seven list. Let's see what movie Jason hasn't seen. What number? And uh, we'll we'll compare number forty six. Forty six, Brendan. In a row. <laughs> that joke doesn't work now. Nah, it doesn't, don't care. Uh, forty six on the AFI. I feel like I may have watched this at some point, uh, but I don't remember too much about it. It happened one night. Frank Capra, 1934. I believe that's about the Titanic, is it not? It is not. No. What? Uh, no, that's not the Titanic movie. That's 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 like a, a rom-com. Oh, so no, I haven't seen it. I have, but like, <laughs> it's running together with a couple other Catherine Hepburn and mm-hmm. like... Um, I can't think of his name. Cary Grant movies. Yeah. So I can't really put my finger on it. So it, it, just for that reason alone, I mean, clearly it wasn't memorable enough for me to remember <laughs> Oliver Twist. 
Oliver Twist. Oliver baby. Twist wins it by default and by merit. <laughs> Almost by default in yeah. my case. <laughs> merit, merit of lack of memory. <laughs> uh, all right, but that's it, Jason. We got to move on. We got to talk about the last movie in our in our in this series of twenty. We have to talk about our second Alfred Hitchcock movie, mm. second and final Alfred Hitchcock movie, and that is The Lady Vanishes. <laughs> That's right, folks. That music only means that we are talking about number 35, I believe. Number 35 on the BFI Top 100. And that is the second and only other Alfred Hitchcock movie on this list. The Lady Vanishes from 1938. That's her vanishing. (laughs) Yes, thank you, uh, Zoo Crew, for providing the sound effects for this episode. Bang, bang, bang. Winky, winky. Zip, zip. All right. <laughs> Jason, you had not seen this movie. No. You had not seen Had you heard of this movie? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I've read through Hitchcock's filmography before, and uh, I knew the name, but I didn't know anything about it. So you spent a great many nights uh, looking through his filmography on Wikipedia. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's, a, he's a, He is a character in Star Wars, uh, Al- Alfredo hitchcock Guru. I like to imagine that everyone that's never been in a Star Wars uh, project on Wikipedia just has a blank Wikipedia page. Well, because for their inevitable cameo. Yeah, right. Well, you know, the only one they didn't prep ahead of time was Werner Herzog, because who could have predicted that? That's it. That's it. They, they They threw them on their heels. Yeah, so this is The Lady Vanishes. Like I said, in 1938, one of the older movies on this list. Um, and, of course, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. But in this movie, we have Margaret Lockwood playing Iris, the our main our main girl, which, by the way, in the 39 Steps, I think I would I, we definitely had a male lead. I think in this one we have a female lead. So it's interesting. Uh, Michael Redgrave returning to the podcast. A young, virile Michael Redgrave. Very young Michael Redgrave. And, and I was looking to see, like, what I remember him most from in the, uh, during this show that we've been doing. Go between. Really, for me, <laughs> for me it's uh, Loneliness is the Long Distance Runner. Or he's playing the authoritarian figure. Right, 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 right. Um, so he's playing Gilbert. We have uh, Paul Lucas as, Do- as the, well, spoiler alert, the evil Dr. Hertz. Um, <laughs> evil. Dame May Witty as Miss Froy, the lady in question who may or may not have vanished. We'll find out. This lady died in 1948. That's how long ago this movie was made. Um, yeah, exactly. Cecil Parker, who we've talked about before, but I can't place exactly where or what role he played, but I know we've done movies with him. His before. voice, yeah. He's shown up in at least something else we've watched. But he plays a lawyer, Mr. Todd Hunter, and Lyndon Travers plays, and this is the best part, this is how she's she's credited, quote-unquote Mrs. Todd Hunter. Um, and then, of course, we have to mention... Naunton Wayne as Caldecott, Basil Radford as Charters. I believe we talked about a movie with Basil Radford before. Yeah, well, they're both in Passport to Pimlico. Ah, there you go. Um, but I think Basil Radford's been in a couple of Were ones. Were they playing those characters? No, not no, in that okay. one. But they do play those characters in a number of different movies. Yeah, that's that's the that's the one of the biggest things I have about this movie is that these characters, these Caldecott and Charters characters, who we'll, we'll get into like more of what they are, but they have appeared in multiple movies characters have outlived the actors because they've done there, there's been at least two other productions with those characters played by different actors there, as recently as 1985 oh i didn't know about that. yeah it's like it was, it was like a, a eight episode uh, tv miniseries type thing so they didn't just like weekend at bernie's them onto the set <laughs> oh if only well that would have been hard it would have been 30 years or so since basil radford had died at that point so <laughs> Quick reminder, Basil Radford got a badass scar on the side of his face that he got in the trenches in World War I. That's how old this movie is. <laughs> and he, he was like a, he still seemed like a pretty young guy, and he fought in World War I 20 years before this. There you go. This movie, though, The Lady Vanishes. It's a pretty simple story, but a, bu- a bunch of people get ho- holed up for a while at a hotel in a foreign country, uh, a made-up country. Yes. 
Um, we never, we never, I don't think we ever quite get the name of it. I, th- I think it's called Bedeckia based on the subtitles yeah. saying that they're speaking Bedeckian, yeah, which is something. a clearly made up language of the actors having fun doing gibberish. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think uh, it, it almost, it almost adds to it though. <laughs> I like that they made their own country. It's like now, you know, you can't say we're doing whatever. Yeah. You can't really offend them, but it, but yeah. it does have that generic approach to foreign people that uh, uh, the British are famous for. I thought it was Swedish at first. Thought it was like some Eastern European country of some yeah, sort. Yeah, could be. Too many white people for that, though. Well, no, there's lots oh, of Eastern white people. European. Eastern European, yeah. Um, but this is yeah. So <laughs> they're in this. They're in this country that doesn't exist, and a bunch of people are hold up, are hold up at some hotel. You know, there's been delays with the trains. Um, eventually they get on a train, and there's an old lady there, and this young lady Iris befriends her, and then one, and then suddenly she wakes up from a nap, and Iris is or not Iris. And suddenly Iris wakes up from a nap and Miss Froy, this old lady, is gone. She vanished. And and everyone is saying, what old lady? We don't know what you're talking about. We haven't seen an old lady. She never existed. And I first thing I want to say, if this was a modern movie made today, that's the twist. She never existed, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> well, because that, and that was what I thought. A, a lot of it is like, is it going to be like that weird kind of psychological thriller? Like, like, is it going to be something that we're going to question her? Like, we question um, David Niven in uh, A Matter of Life and Death, whether it's actually real or not. Uh, well, that was what I was kind of thinking about. The modern example that I thought, and I don't know what Julianne Moore loses her kid movie this is. But I know there's one where she loses her kid and the kid's like never actually gone or something like that. Is that where she's like, like on a plane and then a the kid dis- that, disappears? That's, that's Jodie Foster flight oh, plan. Okay. That movie actually makes you think they're going for that and then it does a 180. So I actually like that twist. So it's like this movie. I, I mean, I don't think... See, Is flight plan a remake of The Lady Vanishes? Uh, of course. They Much like Speed 2, they just changed the vehicle. Um, but, but like, I don't think this movie... Cause, I will say right off the bat, and I think we talked about this when we talked about the Thirty Nine Steps. Alfred Hitchcock not, did not make whodunits. He he had uh, most of the time he would reveal you know the quote unquote twist a lot earlier than the ending. I mean, in this movie, it's a little later than usual. It's about like forty five minutes or so in. Even the the what's going on, but then we don't even find out the the true nature of Mrs. Froy until very close to the end of the movie. That's that, something that's held out the whole time. That part, yes. But I we do find out though that um that she is obviously there is some kind of conspiracy saying that she's missing when she's not actually missing. Like that, we find out fair, like, like well, moderately the, early. We know there's some weirdness going on early on. So let's 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 start off by saying this is a very old movie. It's not as old as Thirty Nine Steps, but it is a very old movie, and it feels like an old movie because the first like half hour of this movie feels like a different movie. But I, I okay, it's good. Yeah, it's good, and I think it's so unique. And I think it's yeah. Go ahead. What are you, well, it's just that when they're in the hotel at the beginning of the movie, we have a lot of like very like screwball comedy stuff going yeah. on. And then this is one of those things I always forget about Hitchcock is that he's re- often really funny. Like he's, these movies are great. Yes. Uh, and entertaining and hilarious. And 39 Steps was like almost a laugh riot. Yeah. There was some really good, really good banter in that movie and great lines. And in this movie too, there's, there's a lot of that. Um, but yeah, so, the, you know, it's Iris and her friends show up to this hotel and they're these hot ladies and we have a whole gag where... Uh, you know, there's all these like weary men that are trying to like get into the hotel and they're all crowded around the desk and there's one po- one guy working the desk and these hot ladies come in and he immediately leaves the desk and just leaves them all there to just fucking wait while he goes and deals with the pretty ladies. I think I think they're well to do as well. And well to do. Well sure. Like they're they're definitely a little well. They look it and they look foreign, so maybe they think they're they're rich and foreign. So yeah. like, oh my ladies. And of course we get lots of foreign stereotyping in the Bedeckians just cause. Um but uh, yeah, so and then and then we have this whole bit where uh, Michael Redgrave's character is like a I don't know what like a like a folk collector, like he collects folk music and and he, he's he's a music well, guy. No, he's 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 noted. Okay, Michael Redgrave, who plays Gilbert, is noted as in the plot description as an ethnomusicologist, as the study of music. So he's not just some weirdo who likes music. He's like a professor. Or he's something. like a professor, which is. But I want to say, too, like you mentioned this opening is like almost like a different kind of movie. What I love about this opening 20, 30 minutes is everything is established here. Yes. So like the fact that he's an ethnomusicologist, that is important later. It does come up, yeah. The fact that um, the fact that uh, Iris at one point gets hit in the head, that's important later. 
the fact that Miss Froy, uh, there's some kind of detail that Miss Froy. Well, I was going to say we, we we start to see the weirdness when Miss Froy is standing in the. Like, I I assume that she was like a maid at the hotel or something, but she's like yeah. standing in the, in the study of the hotel and she's humming this song. Yes. And then we see outside the the guy. He's been popping up occasionally where he's like just singing this song and he's playing a guitar and he gets like grabbed and pulled back and we see the shadow of him being strangled. Great Hitchcock shot right yep, there. Love it. Really cool. Oh yeah, all his all his all his technique is in this movie. As early, as old as this is, as early as this is, it's all there. And then of course when we get to the platform and Iris is getting ready to go on the train, she goes over to see Mrs. Froy and she gets hit by something that somebody clearly pushed out of the window and was clearly meaning to hit Miss Froy, but hit Iris instead. Yeah. So we know there's some weird shit going on. What's her deal, man? Yeah, it's like it's it's like screwball comedy, like you mentioned, peppered in with some off putting. Well, stuff. of course we have that we have that whole scene where uh, Iris is mad because uh, uh, Gilbert is upstairs and he has some like uh, folk dancers like showing him folk dance and he's like playing the clarinet and it's keeping Iris awake. Do you have that scene? Uh, yes, I have the scene where the um, so uh, the the music is going on and the um, the hotel the guy that was working at the hotel goes in to confront him about the music. Iris is Iris and Miss Froy are very agitated by this music. Do you think the guy that's by the way the guy that's singing outside that Miss Froy is enjoying and saying like you know I can't hear him anymore because the stomping upstairs is that guy working with her like is he reminding her of the tune? For later on? That's a good question. I don't have an answer to. I assume okay. that he worked for the hotel and it was part of the ambiance. Okay, because I wasn't sure. I'd have to go back and listen, but I wonder if it's the same tune that she's trying to I, I believe it is, yeah, I would okay. say. Okay, well then maybe. Yeah, let's listen to this scene of the, um, uh, when the hotel guy goes into, <laughs> the hotel guy, he's the only one that works there, and the maid, um, when he goes in to um, uh, get Gilbert to stop being so damn noisy. Hello? country this yes i i feel quite sorry for that poor singer outside having to compete with this boris miss henderson speaking look someone upstairs is playing musical chairs with an elephant move one of them out will you i want to get some sleep okay. that ought to settle it thank you so much. some people have so little consideration for others which makes life so much more difficult than it need be don't you think oh, good night. thank you so much i expect you'll be going to the train in the morning I hope we shall meet again under under quieter circumstances. Good night. Good night. Thank you, sir. Ce la Madonna corta il persica tetta, Miss. Please, I'll fix everything. You'd better. Hold it. Spenny, don't move, don't move. <clears throat> uh. If you please, Get sir. Get out. One, two. Please, sir, will you kindly stop? The whole complaining in the hotel, you make too much noise. Too much what? Too much noise. You dare to call it a noise. The ancient music with which your peasant ancestors celebrated every wedding for countless generations. The dance they danced when your father married your mother. Always supposing you were born in wedlock, which I doubt. Look at them. I take it you're the manager of this Sure, hotel. I am the manager of this well, hotel. Fortunately, I'm accustomed to squalor. Tell me, who's complaining? This young English lady underneath. Well, you tell the young English lady underneath that I am putting on record for the benefit of mankind, one of the lost folk dances of Central Europe, and furthermore, she does not but own some the hotel. But don't you understand? <laughs> I love it. It, it, it. Like, you can tell from just hearing that, like you said, that screwball comedy element, even the sound effect that, that goes as uh, he kicks the hotel guy out of the, out the door. Well, and it firmly establishes who this guy is. Like, he's, he's clearly very charismatic yep. and very smart, uh, but also uh, likes to get his way, as I suppose men at that time did. Yeah, it's a little bit... It, I was going to say... So, and we have to look at the chemistry here between the two leads because, I mean, much like the 39 Steps, we're following a, a man and woman who are not, you know, don't like each other for most of the movie. 
Um, and the chemistry here kind of reminded me of 39 steps, but he's more, a little bit more abrasive. Yeah, he is. Well, to the point where he like busts into her room. Well, cause she has him kicked out cause she gives, she pays off the hotel manager. And yeah. so he's mad. So he like busts <laughs> into her room and is like, Oh, I think I'll have this room. And he like starts pawing at her shit and throwing stuff all over the place and, and just being a real like creep to her, I yeah. guess, to some extent. She doesn't like it very much. No, of course not. <laughs> it's just very far but it's like it's like this is the beginning of their relationship such that it is and it's starting on this weirdly harassing note <laughs> <laughs> but but also not as potentially awful as it could have been given the year this was released <laughs> much much like the 39 steps i was like oh no okay we're okay <laughs> the, 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 the female characters in this movie aren't completely passive i suppose is a big step yeah exactly well, Hitchcock, like, as far as he gets flack, you know, for some of his relationships he may have had with his actors. Is this a movie, like an early movie that passes the Bechdel test? I know this isn't our, like, bag. I know there's a whole podcast about it, but but where, because Freud and uh, oh yeah, and Iris do have conversations that don't involve a man in don't the movie. Don't involve a man at all. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I think you're right. Nice. Yeah. That's some early shit. That's nice. There's, there's multiple and multiple female characters with lines. So, I mean. <laughs> Although there is also a lot of, like, because this is a movie from the 30s, like, Iris is an attractive young lady who has resigned herself to being married to some guy she doesn't like because mm. what else is there? She's got to get married because if she doesn't get married now, and then what, what is she going to have left? Like This is true. Very reflective of the attitudes at the time. This is true, but this is accurate to the time period. Um, I got to say, I mean, I don't know if it's your favorite part too about this opening 20, 30 minutes, but my favorite part is the introduction of Caldecott and Charters. I will say right now, Jason... I know this is the last movie before we do another ranking episode next week, but this, this, this has got to be at the top for me for most British performance. I, I was thinking that, like, the, if anything, these guys have to be nailed for the title of most British pair, most British comedy team. <laughs> to, yeah, I mean, to skip way ahead, there is a moment where one of them is shot in the hand and calmly walks back yeah. to the train and be like, no, oh, I believe I've been shot. Like, yeah, just, he barely even acknowledges. He's, he's just like, well, I guess that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the next scene, he's just got a bandage on it. A haphazardly placed bandage. But I think it was, I, I, I believe that character probably was also in war, World War I, so getting shot in the hand from him is probably just like, well, shit. <laughs> One just, of those, I guess. It's so funny. I mean, but also, given how nonchalantly they are in that uh, gun battle, and which we will talk about. Their obsession with cricket. Um, so much so their obsession with cricket. So I do want, obviously I'm going to play a scene with Caldecott and Charters and then we'll talk about, um, right after that, I'll talk about another movie that they were in. I can't wait. You, I can't wait for you to see that clip, Jason, but we'll play this one first. Um, this is them, uh, in the hotel, the hotel manager is on the phone with someone from England and they are so desperate to find out the score of the, or, or, you know, the details of the upcoming cricket match that they pick up the phone and decide to ask this guy. Let's take a listen. I don't suppose there is such a thing as a wireless set to hear about. Oh, well, being in the dark like this, you know, Collicott, our communications cut off in the time of crisis. Hello, hello, hello. London? You want Mr. Seltzer? Yes. Hold on. I'm going right to, to find him where he is. London. Go on, risk it. Hello. Hello, you. You in London, huh? No, 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 I'm not Mr. Seltzer. Name's Charters. I don't suppose you know me, huh? Well, you needn't worry. I've just gone to fetch him. Tell me, what's happening to England? Blowing a gale? No, you don't follow me, sir. I'm inquiring about the test match in Manchester. Cricket, sir, cricket! What, you don't know? You can't be in England and not know the test score. Tell us he doesn't know. Oh, silly ass. Hello, can't you find out? Oh, nonsense, it won't take a second. Oh, all right. If you won't, you won't. Wasting my time, the fellas in ignorance. Mr. Seltzer, at last your call come through to London. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It is like, I love how they take such contention with him. Well, if you don't know, then fine, whatever. Don't waste my time. <laughs> But and also just the, the very idea of this whole scene, like the idea that they're so desperate for the cricket scores, you know, 1938, you know, it's not like you can get uh, news on demand in the you same can't. way you can today. Like literally just picking up and talk to some random person like, hey, you might have a radio nearby. What's the cricket score? <laughs> you can't ask Siri in 1938. <laughs> no, no. no, you can't. And uh, they might have to wait weeks to get a newspaper to to get a report of that or, or until they find a radio to listen in. Also, I love that you, know, you mentioned there's foreshadowing in these scenes leading up to the to the crux of the movie on the train. There's actually a uh, foreshadowing of what happens to them in this scene, too, because they get on the phone and they say, what's going on in England? And they say, oh, gale force, whatever. And 
yeah, they're clearly telling them like the weather conditions. And then by the end of the movie, when they eventually make it in time for the cricket match, they find out the whole thing's been canceled due to weather and flooding, which is great. Like they, they set that up right at the beginning that they didn't, didn't think into their heads that the weather would be bad and that right. that would cancel the match either. It's, it's, it's just, Oh, the, the screenplay is so tight in this movie. It's just like toy, like a toy girl. Very toy, but still weird, weird that there's a lot of it up front. Cause if they made this movie today, which I think they did seven or eight years ago, um, I imagine that would be a much shorter sequence that you could probably still get the basics of those characters across. But I will say that the part of what works about it is that we do really get to live with those characters through a good chunk of the movie before we get thrown into the main thrust of everything. Yeah. And like you said, it really shows you how underappreciated Hitchcock was in, par- in terms of comedy. He, he nails it like it, it's it's shot like a screwball. It works. And then we get into the suspenseful shit and it also works. Well, the fact that it's still cut, it's still funny today, you know, yeah. is, is impressive. 80 some odd years on from this movie being because made. he knows how to make. OK, because he knows how to make like, you know, I think he knows how to make comedy that is not necessarily topical, even though there is some undercurrent through this whole thing of, you know, impending war. Yeah, because this movie was released in 1938. Yeah, World so, War II officially started in 1939, but there was already shit going on. Oh yeah, there was especially like in China and stuff. But yeah, no, the stuff was definitely moving in 1930 because 1938 was when uh, uh, Hitler annexed the Sudetenland or marched into the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia and caused a big crisis and caused the whole you know there will be no war speech by Neville Chamberlain. And and, and Jason, I'm gonna put on my tiny film glasses. Um, I think. That this whole thing where, you know, everyone else on the train is very reluctant to join in, very reluctant to help, is kind of a metaphor to, you know, countries during World War II. Well, and yeah, where, where, where Europe was at that point, that because everybody had already gone through the most devastating war that they'd ever seen merely 20 years before... That, yeah, people weren't really... People weren't really sticking their neck out. They weren't really hyped on the idea of going and doing it again. No, no, they're not sticking their neck out for, for selfish, you know, selfish reasons. And it's interesting that in this movie, the guy that actually decides, like, oh, maybe we should surrender is he gets killed. Like, he goes out to surrender and says, oh, we can all work together. And he immediately is shot by, like, I would say, quote, unquote, jackbooted foreigners. Yeah, pretty much. Guys in military uniforms. Yeah, from a country that's clearly more authoritarian than a country like England. Now, Jason, I I brought this clip especially for you. And as soon as I didn't plan this, I just wanted to find some of, something of uh, uh, Charters and Caldecott in another movie because they were in many different movies, one of which was called Night Train to Munich. Okay, now I want to play you this scene of Charters and Caldecott in Night Train to Munich. Uh, must have got in the wrong train, I expect. We can have a side east to ourselves, ma'am. Put our feet up. Bought a coffee of mine, Camp. Occurred to me it might shed a spot of light on all this. How do you do? Never read it. Never had the time. I understand they give a copy for all the bridal couples over here. Well, I don't think it's that sort of book, old man. Yes, that is Charters of Caldecott uh, reading Mein Kampf. Wait, when was that movie made? Um, Night Train to Munich was, I think, like 1940. Wow, so they're going to Munich as the war is kicking off. Crazy. <laughs> I think they give it to all the couples here. I don't think that's all. <laughs> yes, I, I believe I'm reading a, a, a literature named Mein Kampf or something. <laughs> they just, it just love how casual it is. Well, I mean, I suppose the one place you could casually read Mein Kampf would be in Nazi Germany. <laughs> but that'd be about it. Also, but, they, they did absolutely give a, a, like a really nice copy of Mein Kampf to couples that were married in Nazi Germany. So he was not off base. Yikes. Um, but yeah, that, that was just a fun little scene. So Charters and Caldecott have been in many movies. Uh, they did radio stuff. Like you said, there are other actors that played them later on in life. And well, they only did it for so long because Basil Radford died in 1952. Yeah. This movie, this movie was their first appearance together as these characters, though, and and people just really liked these characters. And they are they're they're fun characters. It's oh, weird. Totally. It's weird how um, that does that happen much these days? Like you see, like oh, a. Yeah. In the same way that like the, the the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern get their own movie, like like, like a char- like a side character in a movie being yeah. popular enough, like to like get their the own comic movie. relief characters that get their I own mean, movie. Have you have you heard of the film Minions? I suppose, yeah, that's a good example. That's a really good example, actually. It, it's it's a very modern idea, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but then TV did it in the seventies all the time. And Norman Lear, come on. 
But then we get into the main crux of the story, Jason. We talk a lot about the opening 30 minutes, but we need to talk about the stuff that we're when we're actually on a train. Have you seen... I've got a question for you. Have you seen Murder on the Orient Express? Any uh, version? I have seen the Kenneth Branagh version of Murder on the Orient Express. I like that movie. Yeah, that me way. too. It's I'll, a lot, I'll, it was I'll really take good. a stand right here. Because I, I know it was kind of hummed and hawed at, but I thought it was good. Yeah, no, it, it is a fantastic version of that. Uh, Did you get feelings of that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Well, just the, when you have any sort of mystery happening on a train... Um, yeah, it's going to evoke certainly Murder on the Orient Express. That Murder on the Orient Express, which may be the most famous train-based mystery sort of uh, thingy. I don't, I don't know about that. I think, uh, I think my show may have been No, no, train. you're not. You're not booked for this one. We talked about the next one because, but but not this one. You're not on this one. Chugga, 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 chugga. Choo, choo. Go back to Sodor. Don't even go to Republican Heaven. You're not allowed to be there anymore. They don't like you very much either. Go back to Sodor. Have jet pack. Wow. Uh, whoa. Owen Wilson's here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Dude, was that was that Thomas the Tank Engine? Yeah. How'd you get in here, Owen? You're not dead. Wow. I don't know. I just came around. I was just smoking out of a hookah, and then I I heard you guys talking about British movies. Wow. What's your favorite British movie, Owen Wilson? Oh wow. Probably Zoolander Two. We didn't have you. We didn't invite you. Please leave. Oh, okay, everybody out. Don't worry, folks. I'm your uh, I'm your studio guard, and I got these motherfuckers to the curb. Jimmy out. Jetpack. <laughs> wow, we need to stop leaving the doors open while we record. <laughs> yeah. These people keep getting in. Well, actually, but the ghosts came. We, we can't really stop the people from Republican heaven. I mean, they just kind of... Anyways, we we have a movie to talk yeah, about. Yeah, we do. Um, so the, the train stuff, the train stuff. I want to say first of all, um, murder on murder on the Orient Express aside, I also never never got the feeling, and I I mean, yeah, I never got the feeling that I was on a set. I always felt like it was a train. It, like it, it, he pulled that off pretty well for 1938 and the limited effects that he would have had. I would say that the one thing is that maybe the train was a little big. Okay. A little bit big, but, yeah. you know, obviously there, you got to cheat that a little bit. There's also a, a scene where Michael Redgrave literally goes outside the window, and I thought that was kind of cool. That was a... That they was have an another train that passes by and nearly hits him. That looks cool. Yeah. How good is it going to look with Elliot Gould in the 70s? That's what I'm wondering. Or a horse. They did a lot of that back then. <laughs> like it's like you see Elliot Gould climbing out the window, then all of a sudden there's a horse tied to the side of the train, and it gets hit by another train. Yeah. And then Elliot Gould jumps back in the window and goes, "Whoa, that was close." <laughs> he takes his hooves off as he comes in. <laughs> why did I wear why those? Why did I wear the costume? <laughs> Dear Gilbert, why were you wearing a horse costume out there? <laughs> just didn't want to. Just wanted to stay under the radar. Didn't want to mess up my suit. <laughs> But yeah, this is a this is so this is the crux of the movie. It's the mystery, the old lady of the old lady vanishing. The lady vanishes, and there's also lots of foreshadowing in the early scenes on the train too, because we have. Uh, I mean, first of all, her name is Iris. I mean, that's an Iris, the eye. It's what you see, right? This movie is all about what she sees, what she claims to have seen, um, and also Freud. Um, she mis mishears her name at first as Freud. And that's like another, you know, it's a psychological a reference to like, you know, psychological analysis. And she also writes her name in, uh, you know, with her finger on the frosted window. And you think like, okay, well, whatever, that's just to show her her name. But then that comes back later too. Yes, and and uh, through most of this movie, or at least through the middle part of this movie, we are definitely on the edge trying to figure out if she actually is telling the truth or if she did uh, experience some sort of hallucination because nothing seems to quite work out in her favor. Um, and, and we start having weird, not weird, but we start having kind of flashes that it might be real. Cause she, at one point, Miss Freud falls into a cabin occupied by Mr. Todd Alter. Oh, Todd Hunter. Todd Hunter. Yeah. The lawyer. Mr. Mr. Todd Hunter, the lawyer. Yeah. And he, she kind of falls into him and he like pushes her back out and locks the door and fucking draws the blinds down. And then they come by, of course, and ask about their seeing this, if they'd seen this woman. And of course he denies it. Because he doesn't want the train to stop. He doesn't want to get involved. That's the thing, too. That's maybe a comment on British culture. All these people don't want to get involved because they don't want to fuck up uh, uh, the train timetable because they need to be somewhere. Well, in Brit British culture, and like I said, I think also like a microcosm of World War II, of people not wanting to get involved in another conflict. But I think also like, well, you mentioned he doesn't want the train to stop because he has to be somewhere. But there's also another reason for Mr. Todd Hunter not wanting shit 
to Yeah, he doesn't stop. want it to be exposed that he's having an, an affair with this lady that is pretending to be his wife on the train, but she is not his wife. Which in 1938, that is, whew. And interestingly, she realizes that, oh, wait, if she does cause a scandal, then maybe this idiot will actually get divorced from her, from his uh, wife and her from her husband and they can actually get married. So she says that she saw Mrs. Uh, Freud when in fact she actually didn't because she, she said as much that she wasn't really paying attention when Mrs. Freud ran into the guy, Tessel Parker. Can we actually listen to a little bit of them together? Because I just want, I just want everyone to hear the scandalous nature of this relationship. How long does it take to get a divorce? Eric. Well, I beg your pardon, I wasn't listening. I said, how long does it take to get a divorce? Oh, well, that depends. Why? I was only wondering whether we could take our honeymoon next spring. I mean, the official one. The difficulties are considerable. For one thing, the courts are very crowded just now. Although I suppose we barristers ought not to complain about that. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, with, the, with conditions as they are now, my chances of becoming a judge are very rosy. Now, that is, if uh, nothing untoward occurs. And such as you being mixed up in a divorce case yourself. Uh, yes. Huh? In that first careless rapture of yours, you said you didn't care what happened. My dear, you must think of it from my point of view. The law, like Caesar's wife, must be above suspicion. Even when the law spends six weeks with Caesar's wife? Look here. Now I know why you've been running around like a scared rabbit. Why you lied to me a few minutes ago. I lied? Yes, to those people in the corridor. I heard every word you said. It was merely that I didn't wish to be mixed up in any inquiry. Inquiry? Just because a little woman can't be found. And that girl was making a fuss. If the woman had disappeared, and I'd admitted having seen her, we might become vital witnesses. I, my name might even appear in the papers, coupled with yours. Why, a scandal like that might lead anywhere. Anywhere. Yes. I suppose it might. And that's, by the way, the moment where she decides, oh, maybe I should tell them, like you said, because the scandal might lead to him getting a divorce of his wife. Now, after that, interestingly, um, what happens is she says, oh, I think I know what's going on. Then her, her, you know, the guy she's having the affair with is like, are you sure you want to go down this road? Because, you know, my wife's not going to divorce me, but your <laughs> husband will definitely divorce you because he's rich. Right. I think I got the assumption that he's rich and his wife won't divorce him. Um, and then when she hears that, she says, oh, and then right at that moment, there's this woman who's pretending to have been Miss Freud that looks nothing like her. Right. And they walk in with her like, you know, our, our lead characters. Walk Frau in with Coomer. Her, and she's and they say, like, this isn't Miss Freud, is it? And she says, like, uh, yeah, that's her. Like, you know what I mean? She just. Wants to bail out of that immediately. Um We've also got to mention the doctor. He's the linchpin character here. His doctor. last name is Kurtz. I should tell you something right away. Well, he's not that short. Oh, I just meant he was evil. <laughs> he just sounds like Colonel Kurtz. Oh, uh, yes, I see. Well, then they are kind of going up river, uh, the, the Iron River, if you will, of the train tracks. I would love it if this movie ended with like them for no reason just killing a fucking gazelle in, yeah. the, in the food cart and while uh, while Margaret Lockwood is like killing like chopping up fucking Dr. Kurtz and you just hear like Aah. man I gotta make Heart of Darkness on a train that's gonna be my life's ambition and we'll do it from first person like Wells wanted to you know what I bet you someone's done it out there <laughs> ooh what about a VR game Heart of Darkness on a train okay and, okay. then, and then I will be uh, Orson Welles. Okay. Who do I get to play? You will be Joseph Cotton. Yes, that's me, Joseph Cotton. Is that a pretty good impression? I don't remember. It's been a long time <laughs> since I've seen Citizen Kane. The name was Kane, right? And it was the, the sled. I assume he talked like this, see? Because it was an old time movie. There's no one like Charlie. I only know the Mr. Burns version. <laughs> but yes, the doctor, he... Uh, He's very forthcoming about what he's up to. He doesn't really have a sense of doctor-patient confidentiality, number one. Now, having seen this movie, too, I do, yeah, yeah, he's very proud of all his patient work. Um, but having seen this movie, too, like, I totally forgot. Like, I, I kind of I kind of remembered, like, the twi like the quote-unquote twist. Um, I don't know why it's like, quote-unquote. There is a twist. I kind of remembered the twist. I remembered kind of how, like, you know, it progressed a little bit. But I totally forgot who the villain was. 
And even though he's like kind of sinister esque, I didn't really think it was him right well, away. Well, he's a doctor, so he must be evil. Yeah. He's like he's basically uh Larry Olivier in um Marathon Man. I thought he was just gonna try to vaccine everybody, but then they would heroically stand up against him. Yeah, man. I don't want no fucking diseases. Blah. But no, he was uh he was trying he had a certain very important surgery that he was going to do and he wanted to tell everybody about it. Um and they thought that that was cool. <laughs> they thought that that was cool. But then eventually they come up with some absurd idea that they had switched out uh uh the patient. Well, cuz they're like how where else is she? They're looking for Miss Froy and they're like she's nowhere on this train. There's one dude who's like an Italian like magician. Yes, yes, the great uh, Dapo. Yeah, and they have this great little fight scene in like the one of the luggage carts that has like all his magical shit. And uh, I love how sloppy it is. And I love how <laughs> I love how Iris needs to put a little step stool to up, climb up and just hit him in the head. <laughs> I thought that was great. Well, it, it hits him in the head, but doesn't like knock him to the ground, unconscious type. Uh, like, yeah, yeah. The trope. He's just kind of like standing around, stunned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and, then they, <laughs> and then they shove him into a trunk, which has a secret escape, so he gets out. Also, he's an Italian guy that pulls out a switchblade, so there's that too. There's that too. What are you gonna do? It's 1938. Um, switchblades were still cool. <laughs> switchblades were not racist yet. In 1938, West Side Story hadn't come out yet. But. Yeah, so they don't know where Miss Freud is. Yes, they come up with that theory. Well, I think I think well, I think the reason they come up with that theory though is because they go into one of the rooms where this patient has been because the train stopped somewhere and a patient came aboard, all bandaged up in the face. We should note. And when the patient came aboard, they look and there's a nun in there, but that nun is wearing high heels. Yes, and nuns don't generally dress that kind of sexy. Listen, we've both seen black narcissists. We know unless you're Sister Clota and you're going to lose your mind, you ain't wearing no high heels. Every Saturday, Brendan and I drive by the local convent and we sit there for about an hour, hour and a half, and we just watch. And I can tell you that in the, in, in the, the years that we've done that, we've never once seen a nun wearing high heels. Never once. And one time I swear it was, but it was just a penguin. No, yeah, I we we informed the zoo right away. And we well, we didn't want that penguin to get mixed and up we, in that Catholicism. And then we took the penguin home. <laughs> and he's our producer. He was our producer. That's why you heard some of the clanking around in those early episodes, the, the banging and stuff. That was the, that was the penguin. Turns out uh, penguins can't really survive up here, and uh, we had to eat them. <laughs> Good so, though. So don't worry. We're uh, we're well fed, and we're ready to bring you more podcast content. Tell you, Ben, penguin penguin blubber. It'll keep you alive. Is what was what I've learned. They say penguin blubber will keep you alive. Are you pitching Sirius's next uh, or Serbius McClintock's next uh, hit? Uh, I'm I'm just hoping I'm just hoping that uh, Bruce Springsteen of the hit Obama Springsteen podcast is listening. Ah uh, yes, those uh, those scrappy up up and comers. I was podcasting before Obama was podcasting. Me too, brother. The nun. We were talking about the nun with yes. the high heels. Yeah. Okay, so at some point they, they do a swap. And they re- or at some point they realize that it is, in fact... Miss Freud. Miss Freud, because the nun decides that uh, uh, she doesn't want to go along with this scheme anymore. Well, I think because it, it, at first this scheme was all fun and games. But now it's it, like they're planning on murdering this Killing woman this woman and, and, and like, cutting her up. She's like... Well, I think her reasoning, though, I laugh because she, not only, she doesn't just say, you know... Um, I'm against this murder. She's like, I can't you let you murder a fellow English woman. Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's a racial thing. It's like, well, she's one of my own. So yeah. if you just wanted to murder some foreign person, I'd be cool with it. But this is an English woman. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's what happens. Yeah, the nun eventually, like, she goes up to them and tells them, like, yes, it is Miss Freud, and uh, I'm going to help you. And also at first, I got to say, too, I thought she was kind of playing them for the first little bit. Yeah, yeah, that definitely crossed my mind. Yeah. But so they, they do figure it as Miss Freud and they swap her. Who? So please answer this question for me. I couldn't I couldn't remember. I must have been looking down at my notes when this happened. Who did they swap for Miss Freud? I'm assuming the fake Miss Freud, but I don't know. Oh, Miss Coomer. You think they, I think they, so. But where, where, where did they get her? Did she like come in and they knock her out or? Did... I'm assuming Gilbert walloped her. No, maybe. I just don't know how I missed that. <laughs> I don't know. I missed it too. I'm just assuming they switched her. I forgot that they actually switched her out. Yeah, folks, we're probably not going to watch this movie again. So if you would watch it and let us know, I mean, so I've seen it. In our home. I, I've seen it a few times, and he still doesn't remember. I still, I'm still not sure. Is this like when they got King Kong back to the mainland? They just don't show it and just assume that we're not going to uh, notice. Yeah, it's exactly like that, Jason. And <laughs> oh, wait, wait, what year was King Kong? 2005. That was the Peter Jackson film, the first adaptation. 
Uh-huh. What? Da, 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 1933. Da. Okay, so so maybe they were referencing King Kong. But yeah, definitely referencing King Kong. And then yeah, so yeah, exactly. They replace her. Um, they find we find out the Doctor is evil. Uh, there's also like there's also even though we've kind of abandoned the full comedy of the first 25 30 minutes, there's still some comedy beats. Like there's some slapstick type stuff in the in the in the train stuff. Like when even before they have that fight with the magician. Um, we have some fun, some fun banter, and like Gilbert puts on like a Sherlock Holmes hat he finds, and has this like pipe or whatever, and he doesn't put his mouth on it because COVID is real, guys. Don't fuck around. Even um, even in 1938, now it's it's in fact COVID is a time tunneling disease. I don't know if you knew that. Well, COVID 19 just means it started in the 1900s. That's right. That's right. It, it's the 19th COVID that was found in the 1900s. I beat all 18 of them, but 19, oh, that was a pickle. Hard time. Hard times, baby. Hard times. And that's almost directly a quote from a former advisor of the president. But but um and, and then and then this movie uh surprisingly kind of ends with a climactic action scene. Right? There's a gunfight. Yeah, a big gunfight. Uh because they, they uncouple the train. Um they they have the, the you know the area of the train with Miss Froy and all the people who know about the conspiracy now. And they take the train down some isolated. siding that yeah. wasn't the wasn't the main route, which of course I'm sure is gonna uh, uh piss off the boys that they can't uh, see their cricket match, which it does because they end up getting into this gunfight. I think they're only in the gunfights so and then go to their cricket that's match. That's right, absolutely. That's why that's why uh Charters has no problem getting shot in the hand. So did you notice, Brendan, too, that this gunfight is the most like British gunfight that's ever happened, at least on their side, where there's no like no, nobody's nobody's freaking out, nobody's like yelling, screaming, nobody's like having, you know, in bloodlust. Everybody's just kind of calmly standing around. And even uh uh Mr. Um lawyer guy, Todd. Oh, Mr. Todd Hunter. Yeah. yeah, even Mr. Todd Hunter, who is the one who's freaking out the most, is is not like, he's just like, I, I don't think this is a good idea. I think we should surrender. <laughs> I couldn't decide if it was the most British gunfight or the most 1930s movie gunfight. It just was no so nonchalant. And and, and assuming that a lot of these men were of an age where they could have fought in World War One, then yes, maybe this seemed like pretty minor compared to being shelled at Verdun or, or whatever, but... Uh, yeah, it just it made me laugh, and I don't know if that was intentional to play it like that, or if that was just how they did it at the time. But it it, it made me chuckle. Yeah, I th- I think uh, maybe a combination of both. I mean, Hitchcock was the guy that like got some stuff into the movie that probably I think Hitchcock is is the type of filmmaker that you see his movie um, a few times and you get you pick up something else every time. So I th- I think I mean he could have been saying something like that. Uh, again it it ties into world war ii i think even though these people are like okay we're gonna help you we're gonna help you it's still pretty begrudgingly like well maybe and again maybe that you're right maybe that's a comment on the coming war of like the begrudgingness of the people that if they have to fight it they will but they're not really we will but we're not gonna like it all right let's shoot some guns out the window and (laughs) is that what they did in world war ii they just hung out at people's houses just like sat on the german french border and just fired guns out their windows just casually hey don't fire back guys we're not gonna actually hit you <laughs> god do you think the other people on the train like or do you think the conspirators on the train knew that the other people would just like not get involved because of who they were do you think they scoped this out that closely yeah i think they were racist okay. towards british people and and they just thought these people are going to want to get involved in anything so It'll probably be fine. It, it's not exactly like in, in real life, maybe not a great thing to hang your hat on. Uh, but in a movie, I guess. Well, that's why I was wondering how intricate this plan was. I was wondering if they scoped out the people that were going to be on this train. Was this going to be? Well, yeah. Was it going to end up being like Murder on the Orient Express? And spoiler alert, everybody did it. Guys, if you don't know by now. Yeah, it's, it's a very old book at this point. I only found out by watching the movie, to be fair. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> the remake. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, yeah, I was contemplating that in my head. I'm like, I wonder if like, even there was someone at the hotel, maybe that was observing everyone. I was like, oh, they're this kind of person. Oh, they wouldn't want to do that because then this might ruin this. You know what I mean? So, and, and then of course we find out, um, the big, the big reveal, I guess, right at the end is Miss Freud is a spy. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Let's let's uh let's play the scene of Miss Freud telling um our heroes about her 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 spidem. After denying anything uh anything going on with her for most of the movie. I just wanted to tell you that I must be getting along now. But you can't, you'll never get away. You'll be shot down. I must take that risk. Listen carefully. 
In case I'm unlucky and you get through, I want you to take back a message to a Mr. Callender at the Foreign Office in Whitehall. Then you are a spy. I always think that's such a grim word. Well, what is the message? It's a tune. Tune? It contains, in code, of course, the vital clause of a secret pact between two European countries. I want you to memorize it. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. The first part of it goes like this. Ta -ta 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 oh, perhaps I'd better write it down. Have you got a piece of paper? No, oh, don't bother. I was brought up on music. I can memorize anything. Very well. Ta -da 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 -de -de. Hello, the old girl's gone off her rocker. I don't wonder. Why don't you fish? Oh, we'll swine out. They will go on flying until they kill the lovers. For goodness sake, shut up, Eric. Da -da -dum 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 -dum. That's right. Now we've got two chances instead of one. You bet. I'm sure you'll remember it. Oh, don't worry, I won't stop whistling. Oh, this is my best way out. Yes, just about. But you may be hit, and even if you do get away, they'll stop you at the frontier. We can't let her go like this. No, this is a hell of a risk you're taking. Off a job, one must take risks. I'm very grateful to you both for all you've done. I do hope and pray no harm will come to you, and that we shall all meet again one day. I hope so too. Good luck. Good luck. Uh, so what's interesting about that well first off I don't know I love the idea of it's like oh it's a song and it has the it's coded with the uh, uh, the secret pact between two European nations and that the song somehow is going to be able to decode into that I mean it's it, it it's kind of a predecessor of like having a microchip or, or something like that uh, which is kind of interesting but I, I think even Mr. Memory maybe in, in 39 Steps was a little more believable but also, I will say, this is an interesting thing. I just thought of this as I was listening to the clip. A secret pact between two European countries that somehow is relevant politically. I don't think there's any way they could have known this at the time, but the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany had entered into the uh, uh, von Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, which was a non-aggression treaty between the two countries that basically said they wouldn't fight each other and that they would agree to carve up Poland for their own... Uh, for their own uh, uh, uses. And Germany lived up to their end of the deal. Yeah, right up until 1941 when they invaded the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't that end badly for them? Very badly. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, so and that, and that's the whole thing, that's the whole thing there and then you th and then you don't really see what happens to her and then of course at the end there's a fun little bit where uh Gilbert forgets the tune even though he's been humming it the whole time. So oh, I stopped for a moment, I don't remember it and then they hear it and they walk in and sure enough there is uh um, Miss Freud. Miss Freud playing it it's a happy for ending. the investigators. And of course it's a happy ending. It's 1938. Got to got to do it. I like how the the full scope of this plan is never told. Like, we don't know what she's spying for. I mean, we get the gist of it, but we don't know, like, what this is. We don't know what's going on. We know there, vaguely that there's some conflict between countries. I like that it's they don't spend, you know, 20 minutes, like, telling us the plan. Well, it, what's interesting is that uh, this movie is based on a book called The Wheel Spins, which is a novel. It's a mystery novel. And I believe in that one, it's even vaguer. Because in that in that version of the story, first off, Gilbert doesn't exist. There's a, another character named Max who's a British engineer. Okay. But he fills, I don't know if he fills exactly the same function, but he's similarly, I don't think he's quite as charismatic as Gilbert. Um, but uh, Miss Froy in the book is not a spy. She is just a, an innocent old lady who has come to know something that she shouldn't know. And and Iris has sunstroke, not a blow to yeah. the head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's not nearly as cinematic to put that on screen. No. And by the way, Charters and Caldecott created especially for the movie, not in the book. It makes sense they would then be the ones to spin off because they would actually own them. Oh, by the way, according to uh, uh, the Robert Osborne, Turner, Turner, um, Turner Classic Movies, Michael Redgrave and Alfred Hitchcock didn't get along at all. Uh, Redgrave wanted a lot more rehearsals and Alfred Hitchcock wanted uh, spontaneity. And because of that fact, because of the fact that they never got along, they this is the only film they ever worked on together. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. So so Michael Gray, Redgrave was sort of the macho man Randy Savage of his time. Sure? Yeah, because he liked to rehearse. Oh, okay. Okay, wow. I thought you meant just that he worked with one person all the time. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm trying to yeah, think. Yeah, Michael Redgrave here. Yeah, Alfred, I don't like your technique. Uh, yeah, I only work with... I'm the cream of the crop, and I need time to perfect my craft, brother. Listen, Ricky Steamboat and I only worked together once. Yeah. He didn't want to rehearse the match 75 times, so I bowed out. No rematch. Yeah, dig it. But yeah, no, that's um, 
that pretty much wraps up that section of the podcast, Jason. Do you have any other big major points to make before we take a break? No, but they may come up in the next segment. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have some bits and bobs. Age of Radio. Mm, yeah. Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi, said, It is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth, and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day, wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. Bits and Bobs. Bits and Bobs. Days, bits and days, Bobs. Bits and Bobs for us. Special thanks to the local Children's Catholic Choir for coming in and singing that for us. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Fivel. Thank you, Father. Thank you, fellas. What? Fi- I said Fivel. Fivel, yeah, and I was thanking the Father. Oh, okay. Oh, you're welcome, gentlemen. It's absolutely a pleasure whenever you need us. Thanks, Father. Goodbye. Come along, boys. Jetpack. Bits and bobs. Bits and bobs. What do I got? Uh, first thing I wrote down, Michael Redgrave. Yes, hello. <laughs> the first thing I wrote down is that I love the model work at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Uh, where they're sweeping through the... Um, through the outside of the of the hotel, yeah, the, through, through the little town, and I because I was looking at it, I'm like, that's a model shot, right? But then I I doubted myself because you can see the little like people, the little like railway guys moving around down on the platform. It's like, wow, look at that detail. But when the train came by, it's like, okay, it's clearly a model, but really impressive stuff. Yeah, like yeah, especially and they move like you can if you look closely, you can kind of see that they're moving statically, like the little people, but it's still done really, really it's quite good. an effect, and they've got like cars driving along the roads and everything. Like it's a really cool, uh, really cool scene. I also want to say, too, I miss upfront credits. I really like the fact that they show me every character's name and, and the actors that play them right off the bat so that I know what I'm going into. <laughs> yes, and I like that in a movie like this, especially, because in this movie, you have a lot of names thrown at you and you want to know who's who. Also, I got to say, um, right off the bat, I can't believe I forgot to mention this, but Charters and Caldecott, I think they're coded as gay. We have the we have the earlier scene where they're basically told they have to stay in the maid's room, and the, the maid comes down and there's this whole little, like little comedy bit where he's like, "Oh, don't worry, the maid will undress, uh, you know, in the room or whatever." And they give her a look like, "No, we don't care for that." And then later, they're in bed together. One of them one of them doesn't have a shirt, and the other one doesn't have his pants on. Well, because they're doing the thing where they're wearing the same uh, uh, pajamas splitting which is a thing that you sometimes see in movies where the dude wears the pants and the girl wears the so I, I, yeah i don't know i i get that bit but i don't know i i feel like there's a little bit well it, it, now that you mentioned that yeah i wasn't thinking of it that way but maybe uh, thankfully it's not as negative like rope it's certainly not negative it's just it's yeah it's, it, it's very vague if it is um it, it, they, they kind of reminded me a little bit of those weirdos in uh was it diamonds are forever Miss, the the guys that call each other Mister who are clearly coded as gay. Oh, I don't remember that at all. Oh, okay, yeah, they're, they, they they should have got their own spinoff series. I do like uh, also um, another thing they do is uh, they talk about like why they're always why they're running so late, and someone says like, "Well, I had to stand for the anthem. You have to show respect." And he's like, "I don't think the Hungarian Rhapsody is the anth- is the anthem." Yeah, he's like, "It went on for twenty minutes." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lots of allusions to unrest in England. Yeah, which absolutely there was. Mm-hmm. A lot of whimsical music early on. Yeah, but this I, is part of the comedy aspect of this, it. This is when I wrote down, is this fictional country Switzerland? Yes, but it is not. No, it's uh, 
uh, we had that good comedic take of the of the, the hotel manager walking by all the men to get to the ladies. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, what's left but marriage? That's what she says at one point, Iris. What's left but marriage? I also do like when she gets hit in the head and there's that cool like blur effect montage that Hitchcock does. He's really like, I, okay, not to brag, but I went back and I was going to watch all his movies. I started from the beginning, The Pleasure Garden in 1927 first uh full film that's available um and i watched up to like i think uh rebecca or secret agent or something like that so you watched all the british movies i watched all the british movies and the one thing that i noticed is that he does a lot of camera tricks with low budget like he does a, he pulls off a lot of interesting things with limited resources and that was one of the things that i noticed is when she gets hit in the head there's some very very easy, like very simple, just blurring and out of focus and stuff. But yeah, and then messing with the audio a bit. And, yeah. And then, you know, at one point, you have like kind of the the the, the bug eye effect of like we, multiple images. Interestingly, when he did his first film that he could make with sound, um, he messed a little bit with that too because he had whenever the sound came in, it was like sharp and piercing, and it was always to remind the main character of their guilt. So that was kind of cool, too, because sound had just been introduced, I think, when he was like a quarter of the way into making the movie. So just having any noise on the movie was was a novel at the time. Yeah, and he decided to make it part of the film. So like I was saying earlier about this kind of uh, this British view that takes foreigners as kind of dumb and foreign. Dumb and foreign. <laughs> but um, it kind of comes up in that, like you said, when she goes in and she goes to change. And it, yeah, it just comes across as like, oh, she doesn't know any better. She's from a different country. She, you know, it's like they don't want her to do it because of their English morals or if because they're homosexuals and don't want to see it. But uh, yeah, it, it, it just struck me as kind of falling into that. And of course, she stores her hat in their room for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> people, people, like I've noticed a lot of old movies, people really like hats. Yeah. Well, hats used to be a big thing. Like, uh, did you ever hear about the Straw Hat Riot? No. I think that's what it was called. But yeah, there, there was a, this is the kind of uh, things that white people would write about back in the... Uh, some, a bunch of people were wearing straw hats at a time of year they shouldn't have been. So shit had to happen. Well, imagine when... Remember when we had real problems in the world? I know. Those were the good old days, weren't they? <laughs> so the chemistry between uh, Gilbert and Iris, you know, Michael Redgrave and Margaret Lockwood is a lot of fun. And one of the things I really like is uh, Redgrave is really quick with his you know, one-liners where she says something like, uh, I was hit on the head and he quickly says, when, infancy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. It's yeah, that reminded fun. me of 30, uh, 39 Steps. Yeah, like that yeah, kind yeah. of ooh, ooh, banter, you know. Yeah. It's very much like, it's very like like a prototype like Mr. and Mrs. Smith or something. Like a kind of uh, like bickering couple. But obviously they're not a couple, but you know what I mean. They eventually become a couple. <laughs> yeah. In the last two minutes. Yeah, exactly. We'll get there. Yeah, we didn't mention that. But yes, they become a couple in the last two minutes uh, where it's like, yeah, okay, so they've been through a trauma together. But that literally is the only thing that is linking them because she didn't particularly like him to start off. And then they went through this shit together. And then they're and then she's immediately ready to marry him because she's like, oh, we're going to take our honeymoon. She sees her the guy she's going she was going to marry and she quickly ducks for cover, which kind of ties into what you said, though, but where she was talking about how marriage is the ultimate thing or whatever. And then as soon as she sees him, she's like, oh, I don't want to marry this. I guy. I don't want to marry this guy. But this guy seems pretty cool and charismatic. So maybe I'll marry him instead. And so then I can be married and not a worthless husk. Every movie until like 1960, the ultimate goal was to get married. Like the, any romantic movie like this. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was one moment uh, I questioned, uh, and I'm not sure if exactly if it was played for comedy or if it just was because it felt like Iris, are you stupid? Where um, the she was listening to the people banging upstairs, and she walks in and goes, "What is this? An earthquake?" <laughs> oh, I think she's just making a joke. Maybe, but it it just it didn't. In my mind, it landed as a serious question, and I was really like, "You dumb, you dumb person! No, it's clearly not an earthquake." There was another time where she says something too that might be a joke that I was like, "You dummy." Well, she makes a clear joke when she says that elephants are playing musical chairs. No, I think she actually thought elephants were upstairs. Get the fuck out of here, Jason. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, interestingly, Gilbert threatens her at one point. She's gonna. So when he kind of busts into her room and starts harassing her, she's like, all right, I'm calling the desk and getting you out of here. And he goes, if you do that, I will tell them you invited me in. So he is threatening her with like a bad reputation, which back in those days was clearly enough because it made her stop. But I'm a man, so it doesn't mean anything for me personally. I'm just doing what men do. But for you, this could ruin your life. I like how in this movie, the uh, the train whistle a lot of times is used as a transition point. And it almost it almost sounds like a woman's scream. Like it almost sounds like a horror, a horror movie sound. 
Um, but I think what I read is that Hitchcock, um, they, they said like, oh, you want to use these sounds? Do you want to use these like, you know, these effects? We can make it sound like this. And he's like, I don't want to use anything that's not conceivably there. That's the other moment in the movie when, when there's a woman screaming, she goes, and he's like, wait, was that a woman screaming? She goes, no, it must have been the train whistle. It's like, no, that was clearly a woman's scream. <laughs> but, but that's what I, but that's what I mean. Like he only used stuff that would have been in the scene. He didn't want to make effects, quote unquote. Back to that room for one sec. When he's in the room, she, he says to her at one point, well, do you like me? And she goes, no, I don't like you very much at all. And he goes, well, I think you're a stinker too. And it's like, no, no, you're the asshole, sir. You're the one that broke into her room and was harassing her. And and then before that was upstairs causing all this ruckus, this poor woman couldn't sleep. Yeah, but Jason, it was charming in 1938. Oh, it was charming to harass people like that. <laughs> it was a good time. I love that when, they, when they're d- discussing, because Gilbert is the only one that believes her like in the movie for the longest time, right? About Freud disappearing. And, and, having... and we understand because he doesn't, uh, like he, he wants to fuck her. He also doesn't have a reason that this, that he has to get somewhere immediately on time. Like yeah, yeah like, exactly. He's got time whatever. for this lollygagging. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll entertain the notion. Yeah, I, I love when they're, when they're talking about Freud and then people, somebody passes them by and they have this like fake conversation. I just love that trope. Or like, yes, maybe Freud is a, uh, and yes, uh, the, yes, the football game was uh, quite enjoyable. And uh, anyways, yeah, so Freud was, <laughs> I just love that trope. And then there's another line where someone says, um, uh, he's talking to the, they're talking to the doctor. Because at some I, earlier in the movie, Gilbert is on board with helping her, but he's not believing her yet until a specific plot point, which I'll mention in a second. But before then, he is trying to. The doctor is telling Gilbert, like, well, maybe you should, like, you know, convince her that, you know, maybe it's not what she thinks is going on. And maybe he it's says, in well, all her head. Yeah, he's like, well, I can't do that. I'm as popular as a dose of strychnine. And then the doctor says, well, if you coat it with sugar, she may swallow it. Ooh, yeah. Which is mm. that's a that's a loaded line. Um, but then later, because um, there's a there's another plot point that's set up earlier where Miss Freud will only take a certain type of tea. And she's like, here, take this tea bag, make it with this tea. I only drink that tea. And then she says this. And of course, everyone's like, what are you talking about? But then later on, when Gilbert's, you know, by the window, they toss the garbage out or, you know, the, which whatever. They, which I guess they must have done at that time. 1938. <laughs> Just toss the it. garbage out the side of the there's, car. There's no pollution. Don't worry about it. Um, but they toss it out and something flies back at the window. And of course, it's the label for that tea. Harriman's herbal tea. One million Mexicans uh, can't be wrong. That's yeah, that's another uh, <laughs> that, that and that line comes back later, too. Like that. He's part like, I, I think I just saw uh, a million Mexicans in the hallway. And he gets yes. Her outside. Yes. And that's because that's what he says to her so that no one else will know what he's talking about. It's it, again, the screenplay is fucking amazing. But that moment where he sees that happen. And it also reminds me that like Hitchcock, you know, we talk talk about how hitchcock has made so many amazing movies and he's a great filmmaker but at the time like his reputation was that he made blockbusters like he was a blockbuster filmmaker he's like a spielberg those are the kinds of movies he made that we appreciate i think more over time for the stuff that that, that you know that the layers in, the, in these movies but at the time they were like oh this is like a big summer movie you know what i mean yeah exactly um, I like the moment uh, moving on. I like the moment where, uh, uh, what are their names again? Why can I never remember their names? The boys. Charters and Caldecott. Charters and Caldecott. Caldecott. Charters and Caldecott are sitting around and he's trying to explain to him the cricket play and he has the sugar cubes out on the table and he's like setting up this big arrangement to play through this. Because of course, this is 1938. They don't have a newspaper. They can't even read about it. They can't just turn on uh, on their cell phone they can't, and, and they can't Google the, the clip. They can't turn on the BBC. No, so he's showing him with these sugar cubes, and of course that's when uh, Miss Freud asks for the sugar, so they dejectedly gather up all the sugar and put it back into the thing and give it to her. And that also introduces the fact that they've seen Miss Freud and yes. interacted with her, but then they also don't want to say anything. They just hide. They're like, if we if we don't, if we tell them they may stop this train, we'll never get to the cricket match because they don't think anything sinister is going on. They just think some lady's a little cuckoo. Or they don't. They don't. It, it's not their. It's not their uh, ball game. Is it's it? Not our place again. World War Two not our place to be involved in this shit i i love how they have a toast at one point so after we find that the doctor is evil um he toasts uh gilbert and iris because he he's also thinks that he's poisoned them but he says um 
may our enemies if they exist be unconscious of our purpose and it's like that is the that is what's going on in the scene <laughs> it's just it's describing his plot but of course we find out that the nun was supposed to poison them and that's yeah. that's the twist there where the nun did not poison them well what i thought was funny was so he goes in he he gives them this poison this poison this this it's not really a poison so much as a knockout drug in the quantity that he's given them right the idea yeah. is they'll be unconscious for a few hours so they do the whole thing and of course, they pass out in front of him, and he's like, aha, and then walks out of the room. And then they get up, and it's like, okay, uh, clearly this drug is going to affect us at some points, but we got to be on the ball. So at that point, I was thinking like, wait, this doctor didn't know how long the onset was of this drug. Like, he didn't he didn't think that he'd give enough time. But then, of course, we learned that they're not drugged at all. Well, or maybe, though, but maybe, though, also he thought by that by the time they got in there that they were starting to feel it. Because it had been some time, right? Yeah. Anyways, so but the nun saved the day by not putting the drug in the drink. Yeah, I do like that. That that that's pretty clever that they pretend to pass out right there, so that it buys them more time. There's kind of a body count in this movie. <laughs> yeah. No, there's I a mean, lot of casual murder in this movie uh, by the end of it, especially in the terms of the gunfight. I mean, sure, they're foreign people I mean, of the, country that doesn't exist. The but... nun. The nun. I uh, actually I don't know if she gets killed. She's shot in the leg. She says. Yes. No. She just gets winged. But but. Um, Mr. Todd Hunter gets killed. Well, because he and... runs out and tries to survive and has like a fuck. He has like a white handkerchief out uh, trying to surrender, but they just shoot him. But not all the villains get killed. At the end, they're just kind of standing there and they're like, well, let's, let's, let's see what happens. Well, it's like once they're across the border, what can you do, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, the Italian dude who does the magic, uh, the great Doppo, uh, literally does a vanishing lady trick. <laughs> yep. Uh, but of course it, it, it doesn't come up other than to be mentioned um, but when they're also when they're fighting interesting I wonder if John Woo saw this movie because there's a lot of doves flying around while they're fighting <laughs> probably I get it he's a magician he would have doves but if they'd have put this in slow motion man Hitchcock would have been so far ahead of the game hey John it would be, it'd be really cool like oh my god if you put like doves in the movie and like I was in the movie that's the worst John Woo impression I've ever heard that's John Travolta like, like I was in the movie. And I'm not familiar with his work. Broken Arrows. He's mm. in that, right? Never watched anything he's ever been in. We literally watched something he was in for this podcast, Jason. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> the fuck out. Uh, Blowout starred a young Nicolas Cage, if I remember correctly. It did not, but I would also watch that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, also, so during that fight as well, Margaret Lockwood, uh, obviously not much of a fighter, has the most hilarious kicks that she does trying to like kick uh, <laughs> to kick the Italian guy to get him down. And then, yes, of course, eventually has to get up on a stool to bash him on the head to stun him long enough for them to throw him in the case with the false bottom. He's really forceful about them having those drinks. Never, never have a drink if somebody's forceful about you having the drink. It's probably poisoned. If you say no three times to a drink and they keep wanting you to have it, they're probably trying to poison you. Yep. Uh, I still wasn't sure exactly... Even I mean, eventually we learned that she's a spy, of course. But but it I, I thought there was some reference to that they were going to cut her up, like Miss Froy. Like they, I, I thought maybe they were going to like harvest her organs or something. Like I know that would be a dark thing for a movie from 1938, but that's kind of what popped into my head. I don't know. I thought they were just trying to kill her because she was a spy. I guess that's what would do it. Yeah. Oh, so they they the bad guys confront the nun about what she did, and rather than killing her, they just tie her up. Yeah. It's like they're willing to kill other people. Like, why Why not her, too? I mean, that would make the most sense. Because she clearly... Because they literally say, uh, when you know too much, you know, or she, some people who know too much. Jason, you can't even kill a fake nun. No, I guess you not. Can't. I guess they, yeah, they don't want to risk it. They don't want to risk the Lord's wrath. You don't want... You, Jesus doesn't know. He is going to keep track of which nun is fake and which one's real. Guess what he's not looking at? Shoes. I thought it was funny, too, during the gunfight, when they finally got the train running, they're like, the soldiers are all, like, running up to the train, and then the train start, slowly starts moving away, and rather than, like, go into a slight jog and get to the train and get onto it, they turn around and run back to their cars <laughs> to, like, chase after it. It's like, some of you could probably get on that train. It, it, it does take a little while for a train to get up to speed. Right. Uh, and, I mean, this is in an era where people are used to, like, jumping on moving trains. It's what you do. It was the style at the time. It was the style at the time. Uh, did you notice Hitchcock's cameo? I did. I was going to ask you that. I did. I was not even looking for it. No, me neither. I didn't think about it. And then I just saw this fucking fat guy with pitch black hair and a cigarette hanging out of his mouth walk by on the platform. Did he have like, a cigarette? Yeah, he did. And okay. it's like, that's got to be Hitchcock. Yeah, no, because there's a, I, I wasn't even like expecting it to be in this movie because you don't think of it. He's, you know, 1938. 
But as soon as somebody, sh- I was like, oh, oh, it's Alfred Hitchcock, but with hair. Oh, wait, it is Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> but yeah, he shows up. He just kind of walks by. It's very late in the movie. And I, the reason I mentioned that because I wanted to mention that too is that later in it, later in his later movies he started putting his cameo earlier in the movies because even at the time people were always looking for him because they knew there was going to be a Hitchcock cameo and they'd always be like okay where's the Hitchcock yeah so if you just blow it early then people aren't focused on people it. people aren't focused on it people can pay attention and, and that's also another reason why he doesn't like make he doesn't like whodunits because he wants the he wants to be able to get invested in the characters and the plot. Rather than trying to figure out what's going on. Hanging on the mystery itself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And then, of course, we have this very uh, quick decision to marry this guy uh, rather than the the nerd, the geek that shows up to uh, uh, marry her in a lovely finery. And it's probably worth some money. I'm sure Gilbert does okay if he's a professor, but. He's an ethnomusicologist. He'll be fine. Somebody must pay for that back then. I'm sure there's some rich people that would patronize him. Exactly. Just uh, Just like podcasts. Join their Patreon. Oh, that's all I got. Yeah, that's the bits and the bobs. Well, Jason, um, I got to note that this does not go to the Oscars. Um, I was a little bit surprised about that. And the BAFTAs were not a thing yet. So no BAFTAs. It did win some other awards. Um, but when The Lady Vanishes opened in the UK, it was an immediate hit, becoming the most successful British film up to that date. It was also very successful in New York. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the monthly film bulletin described the film as an out of the ordinary and exciting thriller and praised Hitchcock's direction and especially Michael Redgrave, Paul Lucas, and Dame May Whitty. I think uh, Margaret Lockwood is also fantastic in this movie. Um, and of course, you know, I talk about Charters and Caldecott. They appeared in a series of films, radio programs, and a much later TV series. Don't have any notes about how much this thing cost or how much it made, but I know that it was, the, like I said, the most successful British movie up to that point, so I'm assuming a profit. It cost uh, 14 pounds of gold to make. There you and go. And they made back uh, the equivalent of 80,000 head of cattle. Yeah, they made um, all that money that was in the, that last scene in the Italian job that Michael Caine tries to save. That's where the money came from. It was all the profits from this movie. That's the sequel that never got made, though. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, so this movie this movie is very successful. I would say, though, it's one of the lesser recognized Hitchcock movies. I mean, I think people who like Hitchcock know this movie. But I think people who just like are like, oh, the psycho guy, the North by Northwest guy, maybe haven't heard of Lady Vanishes. Or if they heard, or if they have heard, they don't know what it is. Or if they just heard the title, they're like, well, that doesn't sound that good. Yeah, I, I know as a, as a film fan, uh, not quite as hardcore as yourself, certainly. But like for me, the early Hitchcock I always heard about was 39 Steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was cool. And Maybe I, The I, Man I, Who Knew Too Much? Yeah, I've heard that one as well. Um, but The Lady Vanishes is definitely a name that came out. But yeah, I never saw it until now. Not Waltzes from Vienna? I have no idea. Juno never... and the Paycock? Are, the, are these actual... Those are real Hitchcock wow. movies. Juno and the Paycock is the worst Hitchcock movie. Wow. <laughs> it's terrible. He used to make, um, at the beginning of his career, he made a lot of not suspense movies. A few of them are good, and some of them are not. Like romances? Like dramas? Oh, yeah. Like... Yeah, some of, them, some of them are good. Some of them are not. Well, we all got to cut our teeth somewhere, don't we? That's right. Waltzes from Vienna is a very strange movie, and if you watched it, you would not say it was made by Alfred Hitchcock. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, I think, I think that's all I got. Um, so, Jason, I'll ask you. Lady Vanishes. What you think? Really good. Really good. Um, did, like I say, I did not expect the sheer amount of comedy in it. Uh, it was very quickly paced, I would say, despite the the long period up front that they're in the hotel. But that serves as its own thing. I, I will compare this movie to Full Metal Jacket and say that the first sequence is is kind of its own thing, much like that movie. Yeah. But uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Re- great movie holds up. Would be interested to see one of the remakes just to uh, see how they uh, the spin they put on it. Because I assume if it's a remake of it's a remake of the movie and not just another adaptation of the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how a different director would would take that Hitchcock material. I mean, we know what Gus Van Sant would do, but but what about that guy that directed that one with Elliot Gould? I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, we'll find out. Spoiler alert. That's the one we're gonna end up talking about. Um. I yeah. I I really like this movie. Um. Now, I feel bad saying this because David Lean has seven movies on this list. But if I had to narrow it down to one, I'd probably choose Thirty Nine Steps. But it's an, it's narrow. Like it's a pretty it's a pretty close to that. I think. I don't know. I'm having a hard time because really? both yeah, both of them are really fantastic movies, and they both have a lot of lot to like in them. I might give the edge to Thirty Nine Steps just yeah. maybe because the pacing is just slightly better, even though it's a slightly older movie. I think I think the the edge to me for Thirty Nine Steps is maybe because of its influence more. 
it feels like every spy thriller after that is echoing 39 it, it is very much one of the or foundational movies of, of that genre yeah whereas this is like this is foundational as far as trains go. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, Murder on the Orient Express, as we talked about. I think that movie does echo this movie a little bit. Also, um, I just I think that if you're going to do this British list and you're only going to use Alfred Hitchcock in terms of his British film career, you damn well better put more than one on there. <laughs> so, I mean, if this is going to be the two, this is the two. I would argue maybe The Man Who Knew Too Much might have a, might have a crack at being on this list, the original one. Um, yeah, he made two. And, uh, you know, maybe there's a couple others I can think of, but I, mean, I have no complaints about these two being the one, the being the two British films. Both um, absolutely solid, entertaining yeah. Uh, thrillers. Yeah. So I will say it's a great film. Rent it today at Jason's house. Check it out. Come by. We'll take you down in the basement. Don't go into his basement. <laughs> Don't do it. But that's where I keep all the Hitchcock. <laughs> but you will get to meet his dog. He was very cute. He's the cutest puppy in the world. Jason... This is normally the point where we we would roll the dice, but we're not doing that this week, and we're also going to change a little bit the things uh, the way things go. But I'm gonna explain that in a second. But next week we're going to do our second to last rankings episode. Yes, we're going to rank the previous twenty movies we've watched, including the one we talked about uh, tonight or this morning, whenever you listen to this, and uh, we're give out some awards to the last twenty movies, some acting, some directing, some blow, whatever you know, whatever we're feeling. And uh, and then from that point forward, we are no longer rolling dice because we have 20 movies left. And as you've noticed in the last few episodes, sometimes it has taken quite a while for us to get a movie that we hadn't seen. So what we are going to do, full disclosure right now, I am going to announce it to the world, Jason. We are we, Our last movie that we are going to talk about is is number one. Yeah, the we'll, third man. We'll save we that are, for the end. We're saving that for our final episode. Um, but I have put all other 19 movies into an envelope. And we are just going to simply draw out a movie. We're going to reach in like we're pulling a rabbit out of a hat, much like the Italian magician in this film, and uh, find out our next film each week. So it's a little bit less uh, <laughs> less dramatic, but hey, we, we don't want to roll the dice uh, 1,800 times every week. So. Yeah, if you don't, unless you want the episode to be half that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can edit out all of the roles, but like, why are we, why are we recording them? Imagine we get down to like the last two or three movies oh god it would just be endless yeah so rankings next week and then we'll move on to our last 20 it's hard to believe we've come very far don't worry guys we're not going anywhere we're gonna do something else we've got plans within plans we got plans we got plans we're just gonna watch dune over and over (laughs) that is not what's happening (laughs) Uh, but jason if they want to they they want to follow the fun if they want to join the party they can find us on twitter at bfi underscore pod of course, our home base is ageofradio.org slash for screaming country. Stop by, say hi, leave a comment. Yeah, well, Age of Radio, you can do that on Facebook. <laughs> oh, you can do that too. I don't know if you can do it on Age of Radio. Well, do it anyway. Send a comment to them and then they'll fax it to us. Email them comments at ageofradio.net. <laughs> uh, don't, I don't know if that's I a don't real think email. that's a real address. Maybe I, it is. but if, if it is, send them comments. See what they say. Um, <laughs> find us on Facebook. We're for screening country on Facebook. For screening country group. We have a Facebook group um jason where can they find you i'm on twitter at jason d mcleod that's m-a-c-l-e-o-d also stop by check us out on tiktok for the odd video that we post up there that's uh for screening country well one word we're hanging out and then, and then from there you can find my dog's tiktok and see how cute she is and don't be alarmed if jason's twitter suddenly vanishes and no one believes you that it was ever there i never existed in the first place brendan so that's gonna do it for us jason uh we'll talk about some rankings next week we'll give out some awards but until then i just have to say to you god save the queen god save the screen and for screening country i'm brendan and i'm jason poof i'm gone (gasps) where'd he go oh no did he ever exist in the first place well who are you talking about who's brendan have i just been monologuing this whole time i don't know who that is sean connery have you been doing this podcast with me what are you talking about Sean Connery turned into Jimmy Stewart. Oh, no, I think I've been hit on the head. Oh, you stop it, Jason. You stop it. Oh, no, things have gotten real bad. We are for screening country.